the climax was to have been a single blow from a 17th century sword delivered by his lover performing the role of the kaisha kunin the man who ends the agony of the samurai who has chosen ritual suicide this last performance by the famous writer yukio mishima hadn't gone quite to script the soldiers in ichigaya military base jeered at the writer's call to stage a coup the noise of helicopters drowned out the rest of his oration which mishima had hoped would be broadcast live even the denouement was botched it took three clumsy slashes before the blade cut through the author's spine for many in japan philosopher hide ishiguro later wrote mishima's 1970 suicide seemed to be an act of an attention seeking exhibitionist not the sublime patriotism of the warrior who chooses death over dishonor a few days ago prime minister fumio kishida returned to office after the assassination of his precursor shinzo abe promising to amend japan's pacifist constitution and grow its military power the constitution nationalists like mishima long claimed was a charter of humiliation forced on japan after its defeat in the second world war like many democracies across asia japan is embracing a muscular new nationalism to take on the challenges of dangerous new times the problem is that nationalism is enmeshed with an exceptionally ugly history which scarred not just japan's enemies but also its friends last year on the anniversary of the 1941 december morning when imperial japanese forces struck across the pacific attacking the united states great britain and holland almost 100 members of parliament gathered at the yasukuni shrine in tokyo to honor the country's war dead the lawmakers came from the ruling conservative liberal democratic party or ldp but also their opponents on the ideological right the japan innovation party and japan's national democratic party the gathering represented what scholar naoto higuchi has called the mainstreaming of the far right for decades the japanese far right figures like mishima who sought a renewed imperialism fascists with links to organized crime and xenophobes hostile to korean immigrants existed only on the fringes of japanese society former prime minister abe assassinated earlier this month by a man with an apparent personal grudge had helped bring some of these ideas to the political center stage following his resignation in 2020 abe stood in yasukuni bowing his head to honor the souls of men who included 1600 war criminals convicted of genocide and crimes against humanity the gesture drew angry protests from china where japanese forces had butchered civilians in their tens of thousands in cities like nanjing and where japanese forces had conducted biological warfare experiments that rivaled auschwitz in their horrors there was rage in korea also where japan's army had forced thousands of women into sexual slavery alexis duden a historian of modern japan has noted that abe played a key role in efforts to wash away japan's historical war guilt abe lent credence to revisionist efforts to gloss over the sexual slavery of women and valorized the russo japan war which had reduced korea to a colony the shedding of war guilt was abe suggested in his book towards a beautiful country a critical element in enabling the reemergence of japan as a genuine power the yasukuni shrines museum describes the 1937 massacre at nanjing where 2 lakh civilians were massacred and 20000 women raped as i quote an incident it claims japan's wars spurred national liberation movements across asia abe was among a generation of japanese politicians who gave the language at the shrine museum public legitimacy india might have chosen to forget the horrors of imperial japanese conquest as it sanctified the memory of subhash chandra bose but in countries from taiwan to australia malaysia indonesia the memory of those years hasn't been extinguished little imagination is needed to see why many in japan have come to embrace a nationalism that 5 decades ago 
was seen as little more than an aesthetic affectation, a dark fringe kitsch of no political significance. The dragon rising across the East China Sea has belched fire at Japan, threatening its Senkaku Islands. North Korea's nuclear missile program has revived the fear of annihilation that confronted Japan in 1945. There is also cultural anxiety, engendered by a rapidly aging population and low birth rates. To some Japanese, the country seems on the edge of national annihilation. Abe's maternal grandfather, Nobusuke Kishi, himself deemed a war criminal in the early years of the United States' post-war occupation, but pardoned along with thousands of others, was elected Prime Minister in 1957 at the head of an LDP government. He helped embed Japan more deeply in the United States-led Cold War strategic partnership, signing a security treaty which allowed Washington to, to set up bases on the island nation. To Abe, it seemed that Japan now needed to grow from a state of de facto subjugation to genuine equality with the United States. His stated constitutional aim was limited. Article 9 of Japan's constitution mandates that its people must forever renounce war as a sovereign right of the nation. Abe sought an amendment that explicitly acknowledged Japan's right to maintain its military, the self-defense forces. A constitutional amendment, though, would have required not just a two-thirds majority in parliament, but also a 51% majority in a referendum. In a society profoundly divided on this issue, the amendment remained out of Abe's reach. Prime Minister Kishida is closer to having the legislative muscle needed to fulfill his promise to amend the constitution. But public opinion remains hostile. Exactly what a constitutional amendment would change, at least in the short term, even if Kishida was able to rustle up the numbers, isn't entirely clear. After all, the existing constitution has not stopped Japan from investing in its armed forces. The country is acquiring long-range missiles and preparing its arsenal to retaliate against attacks from North Korea and China. So Japan's spending on its military has remained low as a percentage of its gross domestic product. It has made significant investments in equipment with offensive capabilities. The constitutional debate clearly isn't about military modernization, but something more profound. And that question is, what kind of cultural norms does Japan need to survive in a period of dramatic new challenges? Inside Japan's military, the ultra-nationalism of Yukio Mishima clearly has some appeal. In 2008, General Toshio Tamogami, the country's top soldier, had to be sacked after he wrote an essay defending Japanese colonialism as ethically justified, humane and beneficial to Asia. In South Korea and in China, there is fear, well-founded or otherwise, that these seeds will flower into a new Japanese militarism. Those fears might well be overblown. But after all, experiences shapes everyone's historical perceptions. The strategic landscape in Asia almost certainly will force some fateful choices on Japan. Even though it allows the stationing of United States troops on its soil, there is one red line Japan has been completely unwilling to cross. Japan considers herself protected against nuclear attack by the United States extended deterrence umbrella. But unlike European countries, it has not countenanced the stationing of strategic weapons or nuclear bombs on its soil. For decades though, Japan's strategic community has been quietly discussing what it ought to do to prepare itself for the worst. What happens if the United States proves unwilling to sacrifice its own cities to protect the islands? Japan already has a plutonium stockpile of some 9 tons at home and another 35 housed in the United Kingdom and Germany. This is a resource with no use other than in a nuclear weapons arsenal. In 1970, Japan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs secretly committed the country to, I quote, keep the economic and technical potential for the production of nuclear weapons. Ever since then, a string of influential voices have asked Japan to consider if the moment might be coming where it has to make this choice. 
Like other democracies in the Indo-Pacific, India believes that the best prospect of containing the threat from China lies in building alliances and expanding their military power. The debate in Japan shows just how fraught the process will be. What's good for Japan might terrify the very neighbors it has to depend on. I'm Praveen Swami and I'm National Security Editor of The Print.